turn to Proverbs 6.26. Still talking about the strange woman. But don't worry, we'll only be talking about her for the next couple of months, so it's not going to be too long. Uh, Proverbs 6 and verse 26. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So there's some really important stuff in here. Uh, So the first part. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. So first of all, let's define whorish. Uh, Whorish is having the character of a whore, addicted to whoredom, lewd, unchaste, of a woman, rarely of a man. Uh, the man usually is called a whoremonger, if it's mm-hmm. monger, if it uh, is referring to this. So a whorish uh, person is somebody that has a characteristic of a whore. A whore is a woman who prostitutes herself for hire, a prostitute, harlot. More generally, an unchaste or lewd woman, a fornicatrice or an adul- or adulteress. And then the phrase to play the whore of a woman means to commit fornication or adultery. When I was growing up, I don't know if you guys have even heard this term or not, it was, it was in vogue when I was in high school, but if some girl was sleeping around, you'd call her a hoe. You ever heard, have you ever heard that? Probably. I get that stuff in school. Right, that oh, I know. refers to, yeah. Okay, they, so, you've heard, so, you, you, so you've heard it from your Christian son, but you yes. never heard it out there in the world. Okay, yeah. Well, actually, so. I heard it from Kevin, yeah. but that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've heard school to call them loose. Loose, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Just, and they and they would, yeah. That so I, I never thought a thing about it, and then somebody said, uh, this is you know quite some time ago, but they said that, and I don't know if they knew this for sure, but that that they thought that it probably came from whore, like it's just kind of a shortened version of whore, like you're a hoe, you're a whore, mm-hmm. and uh, I never, never picked up on that anyway. But it's funny the types of. The, the things that people say a generation ago, and then they kind of just pass out of existence, and they you don't hear those those type of words anymore. But anyway, so a whorish woman is a woman that commits fornication or adultery. See, she can be a prostitute, but she doesn't have to be. This says you know more generally, it's just an unchaste or lewd woman or a, a fornicator. Um, fornication is voluntary sexual intercourse between a man in restricted use and unmarried man and an unmarried woman in Scripture extended to adultery. So a whorish woman, then, is a woman who has voluntary sexual intercourse with a man uh, that she's not married to. And uh, then that kind of broadens the umbrella a little bit and and puts a lot of women and men uh, under that definition of a whore. So this says, this verse says that a man will be brought to a piece of bread by a whorish woman. I just like the way the King James states things like that. He shall be brought to a piece of bread. And if it wasn't obvious what this means, it means that you'll be brought to uh, extreme poverty, like somebody that would be in a prison would be. Uh, Jeremiah 37 in verse 21 gives us an example of a man that was brought to a piece of bread. In this case, it was a godly man. He didn't do anything to deserve this, but this is what happened to him. Jeremiah 37 and verse 21. Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit commit Jeremiah into the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread out of the baker's street until all the bread in the city were spent. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So they would give him daily a piece of of bread. He was brought to a piece of bread. That's pretty much his entire possessions and his entire food was a piece of bread. That's all he had. He's laying in the court of the prison in the dungeon. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of what Solomon's saying here when he says that by means of a whorish woman, a man should be brought to a piece of bread. Like he's going to be brought to pretty much nothing. Like he's going to be desolate. You know, when you when you have only a piece of bread to eat every day, you're not in very good shape. And this really goes along with what Job said in Job 31, 9 through 12, when he said that adultery would root out all of his increase. Job 31, 9 through 12. He said, If mine heart have been deceived by a woman, or if I have, have laid wait 
at my neighbor's door. Then let my wife grind unto another, and let others bow down upon her. For this is an heinous crime, and uh, yea, it is an iniquity to be punished by the judges, for it is a fire that consumeth to destruction, and would root out all mine increase. In other words, it would bring him to nothing. All of his increase, all of his wealth would be rooted out and gone, and he would be left with a piece of bread, if he was lucky. Now, this could happen in numerous ways. I'm not going to read these verses here for you because we've been over them already. And I'll just refresh your memory. So his wife could leave him and take half of all his wealth wealth, and then take a large portion of his paycheck for alimony and child support. Right? Uh, lest thine, uh, thine honor be given unto others and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labor be in the house of a stranger. Uh, Proverbs 5.10. Or he could be brought to a piece of bread by contracting STDs that will destroy his health prevent him from working, and run up large medical bills. Uh, Proverbs 5, 11, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Or it could also happen that God could just chasten him by reducing him to poverty, by causing him to lose his job, or by destroying his wealth by any number of means. I mean, God can, he controls tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and fires. And I mean, he could, he could bring you to a piece of bread seven ways from Sunday. It'd be so easy for the Lord to do that. He wouldn't even have to break a sweat. Uh, turn with me to 1 Samuel 2 and verse 7. So if, if, if a man is stupid enough to contemplate going into a strange woman and then to think, well, how could the Lord bring me to a piece of bread? I mean, i got a pretty good job and da-da-da. And then his house burns down that night or a tornado comes through. I mean, anything can happen. It would be just so easy. And that's just foolish thinking to, to think that, oh, I don't, I don't see how God could do that. Don't test him. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 7 says, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. So yes, the Lord, it says in another place, that he giveth thee power to get wealth. But he also makes poor, so he can do either one. He can promote you or he can demote you. And a, a fast track to demotion is going into the strange woman. You want to be demoted, that... That's the way to do it, and that'll make it happen quickly. And then the second part of the verse. And the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So this particular whorish woman in this verse is an adulteress. Um, we, we read from the definition that it could be an adult, or it could be a, a fornicator, right? Or it could be a prostitute or something. But this woman here that he's referring to is obviously a married woman because she is an adulteress that's hunting for the precious life. And the adulteress is a hunter of men. And this kind of goes with the previous verse about taking him with her eyelids. Remember, you hunt in order to take. Well, to hunt means to go in pursuit of wild animals or game to engage in the chase. And I think this is why women that are like that, they like to do it. It's a challenge. They like to go for the chase, right? And especially the precious life. We'll get to the precious life here in a minute. But that makes it all the better it's like if you can get the precious life, it's like killing a 14-point buck or something. You know, most hunters, if you've been doing it for a while, you're not going to be satisfied with a doe or a spike or a four-point or something. You want to go for the big one, right? It's the same way with the, with the strange woman. She doesn't want to go after just some schlub. Right? She wants to go after some good catch. And this is what she does. We'll talk about that in just a second. It's also, when it speaks of animals, it's to pursue their prey. And um, that's, I believe that men are referred to that um, in, by that term, prey, if I'm not mistaken here, when it's referring to the strange woman. It's to pursue wild animals or game for the purpose of catching or killing, to chase for food or sport, espe uh, often especially or specifically to pursue with hounds or other tracking beasts, also said of animals chasing their prey, and then figuratively and generally, it is to search, seek, and that can be used with after or for anything. And this is what she does. The adulteress will hunt for the precious life. It is to search or seek for anything, especially with eagerness and exertion. It is to go eagerly, eagerly in search of, search for, seek, especially with desire and diligence to endeavor to capture, obtain, or find. It's a pretty good definition, because when you get to Proverbs chapter 7, which we will here in a few weeks, 
we will see that this woman really uh, is the embodiment of this definition of hunt because she was not just standing on the street corner and waiting, but she was going after him and she was flattering him and she's telling him about her bed and how it's all decked with precious you know, things and and uh, and her husband's not away. He, or he's away and he's not going to be back for a long time. And she's going on and she's got peace offerings with her. And she's religious. I mean, she's really, really trying here. So she was hunting, eagerly searching with diligence. And she pursues men earnestly with desire and diligence in order to catch them. I will just read you a couple of verses here from Proverbs chapter 7, uh, 12 and 13. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. What do you do when you go hunting? You go out. Side, you go without, right? You're not in your own house. She's without. She's in the streets because that's where you're going to catch them. Lying in wait at every corner. What do you do when you go hunting? You lie in wait, right? You go and you find a tree and you stand next to it. You crawl up in one and you wait. And you wait for the, the poor little animal to come across your path. And this is what the strange woman does. So she caught him and kissed him. And with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. So she catches him because she's a hunter. That's what hunters do. And she ultimately kills him, which is what hunters do to animals. 22 through 23, Proverbs 7, 22. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. And then we're told in Proverbs 5 and verse 23, that he shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray, referring to the guy that goes to the strange woman. So she's a hunter, and she lies in wait for the prey. Proverbs 23, 27 through 28. Ah, I knew it. I knew a man was called a prey when it came to a strange woman. I couldn't remember the verse. This is the verse. Verse 27, For a whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. Lies in wait is for a prey. That, that goes so well with the, adultera- the, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So men, beware of the woman who pursues you. Now, none of us are single here, but especially for single men, nowadays things are so backwards and, and turned on their heads. It used to be men pursued women, and men asked women out on dates, and men paid when they go out on dates and things. And now these dirtbags, they don't even pay when they go out on dates. It's like they share the bill or something. I, I was flabbergasted to find this out, but women, when I was in Minneapolis, and I, I had met up with some some youngerish people in their 30s, they were all single people, and and this one woman was... We were playing some kind of a game, I think, and I don't remember. Somehow I said something about men paying for women's dates, and this woman just looked at me like, huh, who are you dating? Like, she was just surprised, like, I've never been on a date like that. And, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's pathetic. And women ask men out these days, and it's just, that's, everything's strange. But be careful about the woman that pursues you, right? It's one thing if a, if a godly young lady is interested in a guy and maybe she puts a bug in some other person's ear and that other person says, hey, you ever consider maybe asking her out or something? I think that's fine. I don't think... But when you just walk up and say, hey, you want to go out to dinner tonight or whatever, like that's kind of... I don't know, maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but that's really not the way it's supposed to be done, right? The, the man's supposed to be pursuing the woman generally. What's that? Right, exactly. And that would not be attractive to a godly man. It wouldn't be attractive to me anyway. I don't think there's anything wrong with a woman dropping hints or something like that, just to maybe let you know that she would be interested or something. But, yeah, I don't think it should go much further than that, personally. Then we're told the uh, the whorish adulteress hunts for the precious life. Precious is of great price, having a high value, costly, such as precious metals. Uh, Secondly... It is of great moral, spiritual, or non-material worth, held in high esteem, such as the precious blood of Christ. And that's actually what the dictionary, they give those examples there, the precious body of Christ. 
So something that is precious is extremely valuable and has high worth, either its physical material worth or else its spiritual and um, moral worth. And of course, she, well, I suppose she could be going after the guy with the money too, but I don't believe that's what this is speaking of. I think she, it, this is speaking of the, the good man that she's going after, the precious life, not, not the man that has wealth. She doesn't delight in catching vile sinners, but rather highly valued men, men of great moral and spiritual worth, men who are held in high esteem. That's who she really wants to go after. She loves to catch a Christian man who is known for his godliness, like Joseph. Turn back there to Genesis 39, 7 through 12. This is a classic example of a woman, of an adulteress who was hunting for the precious life. Joseph was a good man, and she really wanted him. And she didn't just stop the first time. She tried, and he resisted her, and then she tried again when nobody was around. She was diligent, just like the woman here in Proverbs 6 and 7. Genesis 39, 7 through 12. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. What did Solomon tell us? Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. She cast her eyes upon him. She had her eye upon him, and she was probably looking at him with that look, telling him that she liked him. And she said, lie with me. Now, when you talk about direct, that's direct right there. When a woman comes up to you that you're not married to and says, lie with me, yeah, you better do what Joseph did and run. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. This is why Joseph was such a good man, because he was not going to sin against his master who had entrusted him with such responsibility, but more importantly, he was not going to do this great wickedness and sin against God, right? Because if, 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 a, man, if a man's only concern is, well, you know, that might make the woman's husband upset or mad or, you know, devastated, Eh, you know, in the heat of the moment, that's probably not going to change your mind too much. But whenever you think, I don't want to sin against God, that's a different story. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, I said twice, I mean, she's doing this constantly. I mean, every day she's coming by and, and trying to butter him up. Spoke to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. So he resisted her over and over and over again. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him, just like the woman in Proverbs chapter 7. She caught him with an impudent face said unto him. Remember that? She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So, unfortunately, this did not turn out well for Joseph. But it always pays off to do the right thing in the end. He did end up put in prison, but then he ended up being taken out of prison and being made second in command in Egypt. And he did the right thing. He fled out of her hand. And remember what Paul said in in 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication? This is precisely what he did. He fled and got him out. But she wanted to catch this godly man because that would have been quite a prize. And you know what? A woman like that, the more you resist her, the more she wants you because it's, you know, the prize keeps getting higher and higher because the more you resist, that means that the better the man you are and the more she wants you. And that's why, if at all possible, get, just stay away from her entirely. Don't, you know, in his case, he didn't have much choice, but if you can stay away from a a woman like that. The strange woman also likes to catch pastors who are highly esteemed. First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13. Because if she can bring down a pastor, she got a pretty pretty good prize. First Thessalonians five, twelve through thirteen. It says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sakes, their works' sake, and be at peace among yourselves. 
So church members are to esteem the pastor very highly. And what does precious mean? It means of great moral, spiritual, non-material worth held in high esteem. Right? So if she's going after the precious life and she's going after a life that is highly esteemed, well, the Bible tells you right there, somebody that's supposed to be highly esteemed, that would be the guy to go after. And that's a pretty good prize, right, to get a preacher. And many, many preachers have been brought down by the strange woman. And it's probably their fault, just as my, obviously I don't blame the strange woman, because most of them, I'm sure, were going after her. Um, I suppose maybe some of them were the victim, but probably most of them were complicit in it, and obviously ultimately complicit no matter what, you know, who, who started it. So the godly young man, or old man for that matter, and the pastor must therefore always be on his guard.